Hi, I'd like to welcome you to the Austrian Circle. This is the program where we talk about the economics of freedom, here on WHOS Stores 91.7 FM. So thank you so much for tuning into my show this morning. We are going to be continuing our talk about the recent presidential candidates, and today we're going to focus our sights on Donald Trump. So Trump is a very interesting character because he is not a career politician. Almost everyone else in the presidential candidacy has been at least elected, but has been mostly doing politics for a very long time. Donald Trump has not. Uh, He has been in the public eye for a very long time. He's been doing television for a while. He has uh, lots of money. And that's another reason that Trump is so interesting, because he is financing himself. He doesn't have to worry about the sponsors, the people who are giving money to the political process. Uh, He can kind of just say whatever he wants and not worry about the backlash of his donors because he's coming into it with his own money. That's very interesting for politics. Uh, Most of the time when we're talking about politics, it is so subverted by the people who are donating and the people who are putting support behind a particular uh, political candidate that they necessarily necessarily bend towards that organization that's paying them. But Donald Trump is not doing that. He is coming into it with his own money. And again, since he's not a career politician, he seems to come in with some really great ideas, and a lot of people are latching on to his message. Now, unfortunately, um, a lot of the things that he says are not in favor with libertarians. And um, one of the things he says that's very interesting and which is often repeated in the Republican group of people is that we just have to run the government like a business. That's what they say. They, they, we just have to run it like a business. If only we can uh, efficiently cut this and uh, promote this and get things in line with what people want, then ah, we'll have the best government ever. And unfortunately, that's a bit of a fallacy because the government cannot be run like a business. The the government lacks the necessary requirements for business, which is, uh, first of all, profit and loss. And uh, secondly, consumers who are willing to purchase those services and the voluntary consent of those consumers based on their preferences. And of course, uh, a consumer can say no to a particular business. So the government does not have any of these features. Uh, The government is a agency which requires people to pay uh, it, whether or not they like that service or whether or not they feel that they actually want to pay for the service at the price required by the government. So this is inherently very different from any other voluntary organization right off the bat. Um, Another problem with the government is that it does not uh, take into consideration the inputs and outputs based on profit and loss. So any business will look at how much uh, money they're taking in through voluntary contributions based on their consumers, how how much the people are buying, and they will look at their inputs, uh, how much they are paying to produce that particular good. And they'll see what the balance is. Uh, If their outputs are more than their inputs, that means profit. That means that they are uh, serving the interests of the consumer and they're providing a uh, product that is more valuable than the inputs that they are putting in to that production process. Whereas if they find that the uh, inputs are higher than the outputs, that means that they're accruing a loss and they have to recalculate to try and figure out what people actually want or how they can make things more efficient in their inputs and lower the cost so that they can reach that balance to try and find some profit. Governments don't react in this way. And so there's actually no way to run the government like a business. You can't go in and calculate what consumer preferences are because you can't possibly know when the consumers are forced to pay for a particular product. There's no way of knowing. You can't calculate it. And therefore, the incentive structure is different. That's what people who think that the government can be run like a business don't understand. You cannot have an incentive structure where people are forced to pay for something and then try and uh, figure out what people actually want. That's impossible. So what we can do to analogize this and, and maybe bring a little bit more understanding to this situation 
is that we can imagine a person who is being held up by gunpoint by a particular person. So a uh, guy is walking to the subway. He, uh, some guy jumps out in front of him and says, hey, give me all your money. Well, do we know for sure that that person who is being mugged wants to give up his money? I mean, it looks like he's reaching into his pocket and he's pulling out his wallet and he's giving it to the guy. So, you know, if we're just a casual observer and we don't notice the gun, we don't notice the threats, we don't notice any of the violence that is occurring around the situation, we might surmise that that person wanted to give his wallet to the mugger. But we don't actually know for sure if that person wanted to do it because there's violence involved. Now, if the guy just came up to him and said, hey, would you like to give me your wallet? And the guy looked around and said, oh yeah, sure, all right, I'll give you my wallet, that sounds good. And uh, that would be a voluntary situation. And we know in a voluntary situation that the person who is engaging in giving up the wallet values the outcome of that situation more than the cost of the wallet. But as soon as violence is involved, we have absolutely no idea what people's preferences are. And that's really the big problem here. Um, people think that they can point the guns of the state in a particular direction and society will be better off because of that. But we libertarians are trying to say that maybe we should try not using guns to solve problems. Maybe we should use uh, voluntary means, uh, private property, free markets, um, morality, things of that nature, the non-aggression principle, basically. And uh, maybe we'll find a different outcome than all of the problems that we see occur when we use guns to solve problems. So uh, I want to start by talking about Trump and his ideology in an article by Jeffrey A. Tucker, and uh, he posted this on the Foundation for Economic Education, FEE.org. Just a few weeks ago, Donald Trump was a crank and a joke, living proof that making lots of money doesn't mean you have the answers, and further proof that being a capitalist doesn't mean you necessarily like or understand capitalism. His dabbling in politics was widely regarded as a silly distraction. This week, he leads the polls among the pack of Republican aspirants to the office of the President of the United States. While all other candidates are following the rules, playing the media, saying the right things, obeying the civic conventions, Trump is taking the opposite approach. He doesn't care. He says whatever. Thousands gather at his rallies to thrill to the moment. Suddenly, he is serious, if only for a time, and hence it is time to take his political worldview seriously. I just heard Trump speak live at Freedom Fest. The speech lasted an hour, and my jaw was on the floor most of the time. I've never before witnessed such a brazen display of nativistic jingoism, along with a complete disregard for economic reality. It was an awesome experience, a perfect repudiation of all good sense and intellectual sobriety. Yet he is against the establishment, against existing conventions. It also serves as an important reminder. As bad as the status quo is, it could be worse. Trump is dedicated to taking us there. His speech was like an interwar seance of once powerful dictators who inspired multitudes, drove countries into the ground, and died grim deaths. I kept thinking of books like John T. Flynn's As We Go Marching, especially Chapter 10 that so brilliantly chronicles a form of statism that swept Europe in the 1930s. It grew up in the firmament of failed economies, cultural upheaval, and social instability, and it lives by stoking the fires of bourgeois resentment. Since World War II, the ideology he represents has usually lived in dark corners, and we don't even have a name for it anymore. The right name, the correct name, the historically accurate name is fascism. I don't use that word as an insult only. It is accurate. Though hardly anyone talks about it today, we really should. It is still real. It exists. It is distinct. It is not going away. Trump has tapped into it, absorbing unto his own political ambitions every conceivable resentment, race, class, sex, religion, economic, and promising a new order of things under his mighty hand. 
you would have to be hopelessly ignorant of modern history not to see the outlines and where they end up. I want to laugh about what he said like reading a comic book version of Franco, Mussolini, or Hitler. And truly, I did laugh as he denounced the existence of tech support in India that serves American companies. Quote, how can it be cheaper to call people there than here? As if he still thinks that long-distance charges apply. But in politics, history shows that laughter can turn too quickly to tears. So what does Trump actually believe? He does have a philosophy, though it takes a bit of insight and historical understanding to discern it. Of course, race baiting is essential to the ideology, and there was plenty of that. When a Hispanic man asked a question, Trump interrupted him and asked if he had been sent by the Mexican government. He took it a step further, dividing blacks from Hispanics by inviting a black man to the microphone to tell how his own son was killed by an illegal immigrant. Because Trump is the only one who speaks this way, he can count on support from the darkest elements of American life. He doesn't need to actually advocate racial homogeneity. Calls for whites-only signs to be hung at immigration control or push for expulsion or extermination of undesirables. Because such views are verboten, he has the field alone, and he can count on the support of those who think that way by making the right noises. Trump also tosses little bones to the religious right, enough to allow them to believe that he represents their interests. Yes, it's implausible and hilarious. At the speech I heard, he pointed out further that he is a Presbyterian, and thus he is personally affected every time ISIS beheads a Christian. But as much as racial and religious resentment is part of his rhetorical apparatus, it is not his core. His core is about business, his own business, and his acumen thereof. He is living proof that being a successful capitalist is no predictor of one's appreciation for an actual free market. Stealing, not trading, is more his style. It only implies a love of money and a longing for the power that comes with it. Trump has both. What do capitalists on his level do? They beat the competition. What does he believe he should do as a president? Beat the competition, which means other countries, which means wage a trade war. If you listen to him, you would suppose that the United States is in some sort of massive, epochal struggle for supremacy with China, India, Malaysia, and pretty much everyone else in the world. It takes a bit to figure out what this could mean. He speaks of the United States as if it were one thing, one single firm, a business. We are in competition with them, as if the country was IBM competing against Samsung, Apple, or Dell. We are not 300 million people pursuing unique dreams and ideas with special tastes or interests, cooperating with people around the world to build prosperity. We are doing one thing, and that is being part of one business. In effect, he believes that he is running to be the CEO of the country, not just of the government. He is often compared with Ross Perot, another wealthy businessman who made an independent run. But Perot only promised to bring business standards to government. Trump wants to run the entire nation as if it were Trump Tower. In this capacity, he believes that he will make deals with other countries that cause the United States to come out on top, whatever that could mean. He conjures up visions of himself or one of his associates sitting across the table from some Indian or Chinese leader and making wild demands that they will buy such and such amount of product or else we won't buy their product. He fantasizes about placing phone calls to Saudi Arabia, the country, and telling it what he he thinks about oil prices. Trade theory developed over hundreds of years plays no role in his thinking at all. To him, America is a homogeneous unit, no different from his own business enterprise. With his run for president, he is really making a takeover bid, not just for another company to own, but for an entire country to manage from the top down, under his proven and brilliant record of business negotiation and acquisition. You see why the whole speech came across as bizarre? It was, and yet maybe it was not. In the 18th century, there is a trade theory called mercantilism that posited something similar. Ship the goods out and keep the money in. 
It builds up industrial cartels that live at the expense of the consumer. In the 19th century, this penchant for industrial protectionism and mercantilism became guild socialism, which mutated later into fascism and then into Nazism. You can read Mises to find out more on how this works. What's distinct about Trumpism and the tradition of thought it represents is that it is not leftist in its cultural and political outlook. See how he is praised for rejecting political correctness. And yet still totalitarian in the sense that it seeks control of society and economy and demands no limit on state power. Whereas the left has long attacked bourgeois institutions like family, church, and property, fascism has made its peace with all three. It very wisely seeks political strategies that call on the organic matter of the social structure and inspire masses of people to rally around the nation as a personified ideal in history under the leadership of a great and highly accomplished man. Trump believes himself to be that man. He sounds fresh, exciting, even thrilling, like a man with a plan and a complete disregard for the existing establishment and all its weakness and corruption. This is how strong men take over countries. They say some true things boldly and conjure up visions of national greatness under their leadership. They've got the flags, the music, the hype, the hysteria, the resources, and they work to extract that thing in many people that seeks heroes and momentous struggles in which they can prove their greatness. Think of Commodus, 161 to 192 AD, in his war against the corrupt Roman Senate. His ascension to power came with the promise of renewed Rome. What he brought was inflation, stagnation, and suffering. Historians have usually dated the fall of Rome from his leadership. Or, if you prefer pop culture, think of Bane, the would-be dictator of Gotham in Batman, who promises an end to democratic corruption, weakness, and loss of civic pride. He sought a revolution against the prevailing elites in order to gain total power unto himself. These people are all the same. They purport to be populists while loathing the decisions people actually make in the marketplace, such as buying Chinese goods or hiring Mexican employees. Oh, how they love the people and how they hate the establishment. They defy all civic conventions. Their ideology is somehow organic to the nation, not a wacky import like socialism. They promise a new era based on pride, strength, heroism, and triumph. They have an obsession with the problem of trade and mercantilist belligerence at the only solution. They have zero conception of the social order as a complex and extended ordering of individual plans, one that functions through freedom. This is a dark history, and I seriously doubt that Trump himself is aware of it. Instead, he just makes it up as he goes along, speaking from his gut, just like Uncle Harry at Thanksgiving dinner, just like two guys at the bar during last call. This penchant has always served him well. It cannot serve a whole nation well. Indeed, the very prospect is terrifying, and not just for the immigrant groups and foreign peoples he has chosen to scapegoat for all the country's problems. It's a disaster in waiting for everyone. My own prediction is that the political exotica he represents will not last. It's a moment in time. The thousands who attend his rallies and scream their heads off will head home and return to enjoying movies, smartphones, and mobile apps from all over the world, partaking in the highest standard of living experienced in the whole of human history, granted courtesy of the global market economy in which no one rules. We will not go back. That article was by Jeffrey A. Tucker. He is the Director of Digital Development at FEE. And you can find uh, the Foundation for Economic Education online at fee.org. The word fascism is often bandied about and thrown about to to mean anything that somebody doesn't like. So uh, if you don't like a particular musical artist, oh, you're just a fascist who wants to impose his preferences on other people. 
But fascism has a very specific term, and I think Mussolini gave the most specific and most accurate term of fascism, which is the state collaboration with business. And really, if there's anything that Donald Trump stands for, and a lot of the GOP and Republican Party, is the collaboration of the state and business interests, where the state uh, helps the businesses by creating um, uh, protective tariffs and all sorts of laws and regulations that benefit those businesses. Uh, They subsidize these businesses by sending money over to them in the form of corporate welfare or bailouts. Um, And this is fascism. This is the idea that the government joins forces with businesses, and it's no longer a free market at that point if business can use the guns of the government to do things, to pass laws, to benefit itself. And I just want to tie this into the next article that I'm going to read to you, which is about Donald Trump's stance on the drug war. And I just want to point out that the drug war is a very fascist type of systematic uh, structure in society. So there's, there's a lot of businesses and companies which benefit immensely from the drug war. Uh, one of them is the prison industrial complex. One of them is the police who get more money when they go and arrest people who have drugs. Um, There is another organization, the pharmaceutical companies, benefit immensely from having other competing drugs off the market, even though there could be some substantial progress made in terms of uh, health benefits of some of these drugs. We don't know because it's illegal to test them on people. And uh, there's a myriad of other organizations who benefit immensely from the drug war. One of them is the lumber companies, uh, believe it or not, because hemp is a variation of the marijuana plant. Hemp is illegal here in America, and uh, it's illegal at least to produce and to grow. And that's to benefit the lumber companies, these people who would otherwise uh, be creating paper out of hemp. Um, They would be creating rope. They would be creating all these uh, clothing. All sorts of products can be made from from hemp and hemp seeds, but this is illegal, which benefits a whole lot of companies. So this is inherently fascist. When the government intervenes to benefit particular companies and grant them special privileges, that is what we can historically call mercantilism or corporatism or fascism or any of these words that describe the uh, collusion between the state and business. And so the last article I want to read is posted on Reason.com, and uh, it's by Jacob Sullum. It's called, When He Called for an End to the War on Drugs, Trump Claims, He Meant It Should Be Waged More Aggressively. When asked about marijuana legalization at the Conservative Political Action Conference last February, Donald Trump said, quote, I think it's bad, and I feel strongly about that. During a 1990 speech in Miami, by contrast, Trump spoke in favor of legalizing not just marijuana, but all prohibited intoxicants. Here is the Miami Herald's account of his remarks. Quote, Trump said that legalizing drugs is the only way to win the war against what he considers to be one of America's most serious problems. Trump blamed the country's drug problems on politicians who, quote, don't have any guts and enforcement efforts that are, quote, a joke. Quote, we're losing badly the war on drugs, Trump said. You have to legalize drugs to win that war. You have to take the profit away from these drug czars. Trump said tax revenues from a legalized drug trade could be spent to educate the public on the dangers of drug use. In an interview, Trump said he felt it was an appropriate time to broach his ideas, quote, because South Florida has such a huge problem with drugs. What I'd like to do, maybe by bringing it up, is to cause enough controversy that you get into a dialogue on the issue of drugs so people will start to realize that this is the only answer. There is no other answer, Trump said. On ABC's This Week Yesterday, George Stephanopoulos asked Trump why he changed his mind on this issue, and Trump implied that he hadn't. Stephanopoulos, you used to think that legalization, taking the profit out, would solve the problem. What changed your mind? Trump, well, I did, and I I not think about it. I said it's something that should be studied and maybe should continue to be studied, but it's not something I'd be willing to do right now. I think it's something that I've always said maybe it has to be looked at because we do such a poor job of policing. 
we don't want to build walls. We don't want to do anything. And if you're not going to want to do the policing, you're going to have to start thinking about other alternatives. But it's not something that I would want to do, but it's something that certainly has been looked at, and I looked at it. If we police properly, we shouldn't do that. In 1990, Trump did not merely say drug legalization should be studied. He said it is the only answer, and there is no other answer. And while he did call the government's efforts to enforce prohibition a joke, he did not argue that the war on drugs would be won by trying harder. To the contrary, he said, quote, you have to legalize drugs to win that war because, quote, you have to take the profit away from these drug czars, by which I assume he meant drug traffickers, as opposed to Bill Bennett and his successors at the Office of National Drug Control Policy. In other words, prohibition is self-defeating because it creates artificially high profits that motivate people to evade it. Although that seems like a smarter analysis than Hillary Clinton's position that we can't legalize drugs because, quote, there is just too much money in it, now that he is vying to oppose her in the next year's presidential election, Trump is keen not only to disavow his critique of the war on drugs, but to pretend it never happened. So there we have it. Uh, Trump is not a very libertarian presidential candidate. Um, I would be want actually to find too many things that I agree with him on. And so, uh, I mean, just look at the war on drugs. It's an abysmal failure. And we can just look at prohibition to see that it was a, an abysmal failure when they tried to get rid of alcohol in this country. And that was in the 1920s. And it was a failure, immense failure. There was so many crimes that occurred. These mobsters came out with their Tommy guns and there was deaths and all sorts of criminality. Uh, it, it corrupted the police and all of the people who were investigating the mafia who were running the streets at that time. And it all went away as soon as they legalized the sale and production of alcohol. And actually, I've, I was just reading a report the other day that alcoholism is three times less in America than it was during the colonial times. So over time, we have actually reduced the amount of alcohol that has been used. And it didn't take the government to do that. It didn't take uh, force and threats and all this stuff. A lot of it is because of employment. Uh, employers say, you cannot be drunk at our jobs. And then people, you know, decide that they're not going to go out drinking all the time because they prefer keeping a job to uh, the alternative, which is losing their job. So, um, so I hope that you enjoyed this. This was a presentation of the Austrian Circle here on WHOS Stores 91.7. And we have been talking about Donald Trump and the presidential candidacy, which is coming up next year. So I hope that you enjoyed this. Have a great week. Take care. Thank you.